Well, welcome back, everybody. If you would all take your seats, we're going to continue with our uh, service this morning. And we're going to uh, be uh, continuing in our worship with uh, the reading of the Torah. So if everybody could come on in and find your seat. Those of you online, welcome back. Hope you all had a wonderful time of chatting with one another online. And we welcome you again to Congregation Beth Sar Shalom. You are such an important part of this congregation. And it's all about the love of Yeshua and Jew and Gentile coming together as one new man. That's what we are all about. And it is such a blessing to be able to be here together this morning. And so with that, we're going to continue with our Torah reading this morning. Ya'amod ahava batlotan. Bar hu et adonai ham vorach. Baruch adonai ham vorach le'olam va'ed. Baruch ata adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim. V'natan lanu et torato. Baruch ata adonai noten ha'torah. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and has given us your Torah. Blessed art thou, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This morning's reading comes from the New Testament, 1 Peter 5, 4 through 11. Then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the victor's crown of glory that will never fade away. In a similar way, you young people must submit to the elders. All of you must clothe yourselves with humility for the sake of each other, because God opposes the arrogant and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Throw all your worry on him, because he cares for you. Be clear-minded and alert. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him and be firm in faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you by Messiah Yeshua to his eternal glory, will restore you establish you, strengthen you, and support you. Power belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu Torah temet v'chaye olam natabet tochenu Baruch ata Adonai noten haTorah. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the law of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed art thou, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Well, we've been working our way through the book of Zechariah, and um, today we're going to be in chapter 3. Imagine in your mind's eye a heavenly courtroom. I don't know what that would look like because I'm thinking cherry wood. I see the judge, the witness stand, and a prosecutor and a defense. This is the picture that you have to have in mind for Zechariah chapter 3. This is what it says. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. So you've got Joshua the high priest, Satan, and the angel of the Lord. Satan's the prosecutor, Joshua's the defendant, and the angel of the Lord is the defense. So he's standing there to accuse him, to bring charge against him. Now remember, angel of the Lord, that's English, but that's not what it says in Hebrew. It's basically God's messenger. And we equate this to the Messiah, the Son of God. So we've got Yeshua, Satan, and Joshua the high priest. 
Which is interesting, because if you remember, the word Joshua is the same word as the word Yeshua. And here he is, a high priest. So there's a lot of symbolism going on here. Zechariah is good with that. Now remember, Yeshua is the defender. Satan is the accuser. Joshua, the defendant. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Defense counsel, our advocate, our attorney, our representative, Messiah Yeshua, the righteous one. So if Satan's the accuser, 1 John calls Yeshua, who here is called the angel of the Lord, the defender. And how long is this trial going to last? I mean, it's, it's like almost a farce. You can't compete with Yeshua. There's no argument. It's almost like, okay, let Satan say whatever he wants to say, but you know he's not going to win. He's the Perry Mason of heaven. It ain't going to happen. Nobody's going to beat him. So it's a very quick trial. Satan's up there trying to make Joshua look bad, bring all sorts of accusations against him. And here's what is said in the heavenly courtroom, verse 2. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a man? Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? All right, before I explain that portion, I want to deal with that word rebuke. It's not a word we use in modern English. I think the closest we have is reprimand. But to me, that's too weak a word. I don't chew out, put down vocally, very forcefully. So the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. It's like, shut up. You're done. <laughs> it's about as harsh as it can get. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He really doesn't have much to say after that. <laughs> Satan, you'll notice, is not just rebuked. He's rebuked in the name of the Lord. Even when the Lord himself rebukes Satan, he rebukes him in the name of the Lord. Don't you ever go to battle against Satan in your own power, in your own name. You will lose. He is one tough hombre against God. Of course not, but you're not God. Even when the Lord himself rebukes him, he says, the Lord rebuke you. It's almost like a, a formula, at least a concept, that when you go to battle against Satan, and by the way, today's message is called Fighting Satan. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you five battle plans for going to war with him. I just want you to know, do it in the name of the Lord. Jude 1.9, listen. Even the archangel Michael. Do you know what archangel means? You got an angel, and then you got uber angel. That's what archangel means. Chief of angels. Ultimate angel. Michael is one of the chief angels. He's going to battle against Satan. Remember, Satan's a demon. So he's an uber demon. Chief demon, going to battle against chief angel. Even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Even the archangel Michael relied upon the Lord in his battle with Satan. He wouldn't go it in his own power. I don't think that's because Michael's a sissy or scared. But why in the world would you go to battle against Satan without God's power if you can go to battle with God's power? So it only makes sense that he would draw upon that formula. And I don't want to reduce it to that. So the scripture said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. This is the Zechariah passage. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? So the angel of the Lord is representing Joshua. Satan's trying to accuse him and make him look bad. And he said, he's a man snatched from the fire. Can't that be said from all, for all of us? Think about it. You know? Ever heard that saying, getting into heaven with your coattails on fire? Well, that's all of us. We all get into heaven that way. We get snatched out of the fire. Every one of us that's snatched. It's interesting how Jude, which I just read to you, paralleled Zechariah with the Lord rebuke you, phraseology. We're going to see 
Jude parallels Zechariah at least three more times. Listen. Jude one twenty one, Remain in God's love as you look for the mercy of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, which brings eternal life. Show mercy to those who have doubts. Save others by snatching them from the fire. So in Zechariah, it says the Lord rebuke you. In Jude, Michael says the Lord rebuke you. In Zechariah, it says Joshua has been snatched from the fire. In Jude, it says you have mercy and you snatch people from the fire. You're body snatchers. We're firemen. God wants us to go about snatching people who are falling into the flames. It's almost like the, the image is we're standing all around the abyss of hell and people are trying to fall in and we're trying to grab them and yank them out. That's what this life is, people. That's exactly what this life is. And though I like the beach as much as the next guy, we're here for a purpose and we have not yet entered into our rest. Do you remember the end of Schindler's List? where on the one hand they were praising him for saving so many people, but he was remorseful. He could have done so much more. Let's not stand before God and be remorseful. Let's snatch, grab as many people out of that fire as possible. Remain in God's love as you look for the mercy of the Lord. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. You know, in our walk with Messiah, sometimes we're the snatchers, Sometimes we're the stick, you know? And everyone that gets snatched out of the fire, you know, dust it off, and then they become a snatcher themselves. That's the process. We save, they save. We save, they save. So Joshua was a burning stick snatched from the fire. The same verbiage was used in Jude. Let's go to verse 3 in Zechariah, and we're going to see additional verbiage used from Jude. Verse 3, Zechariah. Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Joshua the high priest, the most holy man in ancient Israel at this time, he was the high priest that God chose for the generation that came back to rebuild the temple. He was a good man. But standing before God, he looked filthy and dirty. He needed divine help. He needed purification that only God can give. Depicted in his dirty clothes. As if you can imagine somebody just rolling around in manure for a couple months and it drying in the Israeli sun. He stands before God looking like that. Snatched from the fire. That's what you look like. You're dirty. But God says, take off those dirty clothes. Give him something clean, rich, and royal to wear. Dirty clothes in the Bible, in many places, stand for sin. So when you see white robes, it stands for purity, holiness, salvation, redemption, that type of thing. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The dirtier you get, the more sin it represents. The brighter you get, the more holiness it represents. So that brings us back to Jude. Listen to what he says. Remain in God's love as you look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, which brings eternal life. Show mercy to those who have doubts. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Listen. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the clothes stained by their sinful lives. Jude is using the exact same imagery that Zechariah was using. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the clothes stained by their sinful lives. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to ask yourself, do you hate sin? God hates it. It killed his son. It tortured him. It crucified him. And it sends his children to hell. God hates sin. We can't have a dalliance with it. We can't have an on and off again love affair with it. It's bad. It's evil. It would be like being addicted to terminal cancer. Oh yeah, I know you can cleanse me from it, but I kind of like it. Can I have a little bit of health and a little bit of cancer? Who would do that? 
We just want it out. But we find something, I mean, we like sin. I mean, if we didn't like sin, no one would do it, right? <laughs> There's something attractive about it. It's that sweet flavor of the rat poison. There's something about the poison that attracts the rat. It smells good, but it kills the rat. That's sin. And God's trying to tell us, be smarter than rats. I'm telling you, it's not good for you. I don't care how it smells and tastes. Don't touch. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the clothes stained by their sinful lives. Oh, I long for some white clothing. You know, I'm not the neatest eater on the planet. And I can't tell you how many nice shirts I've lost to a dinner. <laughs> I've gotten to the part now that when I'm at home, if I spill on my shirt, I take it off, take it to the sink, put soap on it, wash it, and throw it in the washing machine. If I'm at a restaurant, I'll hit the restroom and smear soap in it. I hate losing shirts. You know, it's just one little drop of pasta sauce and the whole shirt's ruined. I hate that. Or grease. Grease just does... I don't understand. What is it doing to my clothes? You get a little speck of grease on there and it just doesn't come out. You'd think after the 30th wash, it wouldn't be there anymore. Well, I guess it's not, but it did something to the clothes because it is forever stained and ruined. And have you ever done this? Oh, look, it's a little red spot. Oh, look, it's a big red spot. <laughs> That's what happens when we try to cleanse our own sin. We just make it worse. But there's a day coming we're going to have sin-free garments. Revelation 3, 4 through 5. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. Wow. Catch that. This is that place where it doesn't say because Yeshua is worthy. It says because we are worthy. Don't beat yourself up. God places high value on you. Don't ever think otherwise. He's talking to overcomers, though. Those who've recognized their sin and repented of it and have been given white garments like Joshua was. They are worthy. Those who don't are not. But that choice is ours. We can be those whom God himself calls worthy. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. How do we overcome? Through the word of the Lord, through the testimony of Yeshua, by giving our lives to him. It's not by being super-duper saints. It's not by, you know, keeping a scorecard of all the good things you do, and when you hit 100, you win. It's turning from your sin and embracing Yeshua, and we overcome through him. Just like I said before, the Lord rebuke you. We don't do it in our own strength. We do it in his. We overcome in him, through him, by him. I do find it interesting, though, in Revelation, where it talks about these white garments, angels are mentioned. In Jude, Angels are mentioned where it talks about dirty clothes. And in Zechariah, same thing. Angels are active in God's plan of redemption for humanity. And fallen angels are active in trying to foil God's plan of redemption for humanity. We've given fallen angels a new name. We call them demons. But they are angels who turn their backs on God. We've got archangels. There's one archdemon. We call him Satan, or the devil. He's the head of the angels that fell. So we've got the holy angels on our side. When the Lord said, take off Joshua's dirty clothes and put clean clothes on him, he was talking to the angels. In Revelation, the angels are present. The head chief bad angel is Satan. He's active. He does not want you wearing white garments. He wants you mired in your filth, and he doesn't want you snatched from the fire. He wants your company. 
He will do everything within his power to keep you from following God. And if you follow God, then he'll do everything within his power to shipwreck you. So what can we do to resist him? I told you I was going to give you a five-part battle plan for fighting Satan. Battle plan, number one. I already told you, when you fight Satan, do it in the name of the Lord. Do not go to battle with Satan on your own power. If Michael the archangel needed to claim the name of the Lord, if the Lord himself used the formula, the Lord rebuke you, he's setting up a pattern for us. If you need to fight Satan, do so in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord means on his behalf, in his authority, because of him, for him, through him, based in and on him. Self isn't part of the picture or the instrument that the Lord would use. So battle plan number one, fight Satan in the name of the Lord. There were um, some Jewish exorcists back in the days of the Apostle Paul. And there was Paul. And there was this possessed guy. And these Jewish exorcists tried to cast out the demon, but they didn't do it in the name of the Lord. They kind of did. What they did is they said, in the name of Yeshua that Paul preaches. So they did do it in the name of the Lord. But yet the demoniac beat them up and they fled naked from his presence. He just beat up all the exorcists. So Paul did it in the name of Yeshua and he had victory over the demons. These guys did it in the name of Yeshua and didn't. What's the difference? The difference is they didn't know Yeshua. Paul did. So in the name of isn't a verbal formula that'll work. A non-believer can't say in the name of Yeshua and expect anything. But a believer can because he or she has a relationship with the Lord. Battle plan number two. I want to reference you to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Why don't you go ahead and open up your Bibles there as I open mine. Hebrews chapter 12. And I've told you this before. It's a great program if you don't have it yet. It's called My Sword for those of you who have a smartphone. I guess it doesn't work on dumb phones. <laughs> and I'm going to read to you from the International Standard Version. Listen to what it says. Therefore, having so vast a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, throwing off everything that hinders us, and especially the sin that so easily entangles us, let us keep running with endurance the race set before us. Throwing off that sin that so easily entangles us. You cannot go to battle entangled. You need to be free to move, to fight. Battle plan number two. Go to war unchained, unshackled, unentangled. How do you do that? You have to have your sin removed because the shackles are sin. Sin is a shackle. It will weigh you down and it will not permit you to fight. Just like dirty clothes, clean clothes, the dirty clothes represented sin, the clean clothes represented purity, the shackles here represent sin. So you want to go to battle unshackled, having repented of your sin. The Bible says plainly, if, you confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So battle plan number one, go in the name of the Lord. Battle plan number two, go unshackled. Have your sins forgiven. Battle plan number three. My military people will appreciate this probably more than uh, anyone else. Go to battle as a team. There is no army of one. Even a sniper doesn't go to battle alone. Nobody goes to battle alone. There's always a team. Do not go to battle with Satan alone. When the Lord sent out the apostles, filled them with the Holy Spirit, and empowered them to cast out demons, he sent them out in twos. The smallest team you ever want to go to battle with is two. But I'd like to apply the principle I learned back in my law enforcement learning days. If there's one of them... There should be five of you. If he's unarmed, 
use a baton. If he's got a baton, use a gun. He's got a gun, use a SWAT team. <laughs> it's not supposed to be fair. We're not going to play. We're going to win. Never go to Satan's battle to play. Never go alone. It's a team sport. Battle is a team event. Yeshua sent them by twos. When Jude said, save others by snatching them from the fire, that even infers a team. We're looking out for others. We're, we're, we've got somebody's back. You know, we're snatching you out of the fire. Someday you'll snatch somebody else out of the fire. It's a group thing. But probably nothing is more profound in the scripture when it talks about working as a team as the illustration that Paul gave of the body, the body of Messiah. He doesn't see anybody as an individual in God's kingdom. Because we're not. We immediately become part of what he calls a body. That's a finger, but it's not my finger. That's stupid. Of course it's my finger. And, it, and I don't think of it in the sense of, well, that's Fred, that's Jack, that's John. I like Jack, but not Fred. It's, just, it's me. This is part of me, you know? How many pieces can you cut off till it's not you anymore? From God's perspective, we're one. I know this is a little awkward. So for those of you who are like introverts, just, just look straight ahead. But the rest of you, look to your left. And look to your right. Look at the person in front of you. Especially people you don't know. Because most of the people in this room are part of you. And if you don't know them, get to know them. I mean, they're not... I'm going to Israel in May. I'm going to try again to meet up with some relatives I have there who I don't know. Why? Because they're my relatives. But I don't know them. Yeah, they're cousins, 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 once removed, twice removed on my mother's side. I don't know. But I know they're relatives, so I want to meet them. Well, you know what? That pe those people I just told you to look at whom you don't know, they're not your cousins, cousins, twice removed. They're your brother and your sister. You should know them. They're your, they're your left hand. You should know them. We started small groups on Wednesday nights to help you get to know one another better. It's a time of fellowship and bonding. So you don't go to war alone. You know, you show up to a service on Saturday morning or, uh, late, leave early, don't get to know anybody, you're comfortable. Great, stay comfortable, stay alone. And when the battle comes, you're going to be alone. Don't do that. And it isn't just about you. You know, if I hear from, from somebody one more time that I left such and such a congregation because they weren't meeting my needs, I think I'll explode. <laughs> Just to say, were you meeting their needs? Like Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you. It's not about you, it's about us. And I'm telling you, if you're sneaking in late and sneaking out early, you're not doing your part. You've got to help people. You're there to snatch people. And you're there to minister to people. Don't think you're insignificant. You're extremely important. When we talk about important parts of the body of Messiah, what do you hear? Oh, the pastor! Imagine the quarterback without the center. Hut one! Hut two! Hut three! Hut four! Hut five! Hut six! Nothing happens. But nobody thinks of the center as being important. He passes the quarterback the ball every time. But how often is he determined player of the year? <laughs> and not only does he pass the quarterback the ball, he blocks the quarterback from an immediate tackle. He's got to pass him the ball at the same time he protects the quarterback. So yeah, I, I know the quarterback's important, and they get all the glory too. But are they more important than the center? No, you've got no game without a center. To me, one of the most important uh, gifts in this body is the gift of exhortation, the gift of encouragement. Some of you don't think you have a spiritual gift, but you're, you're nice to be around. You encourage us. You give us strength to go on. I love people with the gift of exhortation because sometimes you're just down in the dumps and they come along and they say nice things to you and they, they just give you a little oomph. You know, that guy who runs the marathon, he's the star 
But those people who handed him cups of water every couple of miles, and then his family, who's at like mile 20, what happens to be his wall, and says, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Without them there, he wouldn't have done it. You might be the guy that hands somebody the cup of water. Don't think that's unimportant. You might be the center. You might just be the guy on the sideline saying, you can do it, you can do it. You're important, whatever your piece is. Battle plan number one, fight Satan in the name of the Lord. Battle plan number two, go to war unchained. Battle plan number three, go to war as a team. Battle plan number four, go to war armed. Our weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I know you know this. How in the world is that a weapon? But it is in the spiritual battle. I know that when the Holy Spirit led Yeshua, the Son of God, the Messiah himself, out into the wilderness to be tested by the devil, that they had a fighting match. They wrestled, figuratively speaking, and Yeshua won. He didn't win by using divine power and banishing Satan to the Netherlands. He won by quoting scripture. Satan quoted scripture too. This was a duel. This was a fencing match. And Yeshua won. Maybe I would say he won because he knew the word of God better. But maybe I can just say he won because he knew the word of God. You don't have to know it better than Satan. You just have to know it. That's your weapon. He cannot stand against it for long. This is your weapon. Keep it shiny. Keep it sharp. Know the word of God. And when you're in it to win it against the devil, use this as your guide. Remember? Satan said, hey, if you're the son of God and you're hungry... Command these stones to become bread. And he was hungry. And he was the son of God. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I don't need to do what you say, Satan. I'll trust God and his word. And he says, I'm all right. Well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. Because it says his angels will bear you up. You won't even dash your foot up against the stone. Satan quoted the scriptures right. It does say that about the Messiah back in the Psalms. But Yeshua said, it also says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Hey, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you just fall down and worship me. Get behind me. Get out of here. Because it's written, you should worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And Satan left. Chased him off with his sword, put his tail between his legs, and ran. Go to war armed. Your arm is the word your arm is the sword, the word of the Lord. Learn it. Fight Satan in the name of the Lord. Number one. Number two, go to war unchained. Number three, go to war as a team. Number four, go to war armed. And number five, our last one, you don't want to just go armed. You also want to go armored. You want some protection. But again, it's a spiritual battle. So what is our armor? Finally, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and having done everything to stand, stand firm. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet 
fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Don't have time to go into that in detail, but don't really need to. Truth, righteousness are the first two things mentioned. When you fight Satan, you better have your integrity up. You better be walking with God. Similar to being unchained. Of course, be saved. I told you the same. Shield of faith, which is the one thing we hadn't talked about yet this morning. You trust the Lord, you've got nothing to fear from the enemy, period. Sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God, those are six things. And for the number seven, the, perf- the number of perfection, prayer. Go into battle with prayer. Remember, we're not fighting humans. We're fighting against forces and authorities and against rulers of darkness and powers in the spiritual world, Ephesians six twelve. Our battle is spiritual. And it's a battle we can win if we'll follow the Lord and his battle plan. So what I want to leave you with this morning is one burning question. Not do you fight in the name of the Lord. Not do you go to war as a team. Not do you go to war armed or armored. The very first step, have you been unchained? Have you been unshackled? Are the weights and the sins still entangling you and tripping you up? Ask the Lord to deliver you. Come to him, repenting fully and completely of your sins, holding nothing back. Because if you hold a little back, you're holding it all back. He's into complete renovation, not partial remodels. He wants to put a new spirit in you and have you be born again and take off your dirty clothes and give you robes of righteousness. And we do that through faith. If you've not yet made a commitment to follow Yeshua, I would urge you to do so. This is the key question and decision that you'll make in life that will set your eternity in motion for better. And I hope that you'll make the decision to follow Yeshua this morning. Please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for showing us how to go to battle. And Lord, right now I pray that none of us would go alone, that we would lean on each other day in and day out because the battle is daily. And I pray you would give us the victory in the name of the Lord, Yeshua. May our swords be sharp. May our lives be pure, our clothes unstained. May our testimony be true and our will be yours. Lord, help us to snatch others from the fire and to hate even our own garments spotted by sin. We thank you for Yeshua, and we pray that we would be amongst those you call worthy. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and join us? Oh
benediction and I'm going to this morning but I want to add something to it an additional benediction from the new covenant please bow your heads now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever Amen. Yevarechach Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'ikunecha Yis Adonai panavalecha v'yoseim lecha Shalom May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. I'm going to ask Kathy and Bob to hang out up here for those of you who want to meet them and ask them some questions. The rest of you, God willing, I will see you uh, Wednesday night at 630. And the prayer room's open for those of you who want prayer. God bless and Shabbat Shalom.